The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning. If you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 8, we will consider the second I am statement of Jesus that John records for us. I am the light of the world. And the series that we're in, looking at the I am statements, has both a narrow and a broad focus. There's an immediate context into which Jesus makes these statements in John, but there's also a very broad context, the entire biblical revelation that really informs the fullness of the meaning of each statement that Jesus intends that he makes. And so this morning we're going to do just that. We're going to address the broad biblical context of light, and then we're going to make our way into the near context uh, into which Jesus is speaking. And so look with me at John chapter 8, verse 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Let's pray. (coughs) Father, thank you for our time as your body to open your word, to hear from you, to be encouraged by these words of eternal life. God, thank you that you spoke And there was light. And we bow to that awesome power. And God, thank you that you sent your son into this dark world that we might see him as the light. And so we come this morning as sinners that have been redeemed by your grace and your mercy. And we love you. And we thank you for that. And you are altogether worthy and altogether lovely. Help us this morning to hear your voice, to hear your word, to be doers of it. Pray that you would encourage our hearts corporately in the gospel in Christ this morning. As we consider this statement in John 8. In Jesus' name, amen. Last night, I walked out of my house late in the dark to pick up uh, one of my kids from an event. And uh, as soon as I walked out the door, I heard big wings fluttering right over me. And there is a monster owl that lives in my neighborhood. He goes from my house, he swoops to the next house, and he eats rabbits. And, And as soon as I walked out, this fluttering takes place. And I thought, does my head look like a rabbit? In this moment. And as I turned and I looked back in the darkness, over my house, massive shooting star, just across, just big tail, just burning across uh, the sky. And uh, I don't know what it is, but that's like winning the lottery. That's exciting. Our hearts, there's something about light on a backdrop of darkness. Um, And I didn't really care about the owl anymore. I just saw the shooting star. And after I've been studying for two or three weeks about light, I was like, that's it. Why why do our hearts resonate with light in the darkness? Light is perhaps the broadest, most far-reaching theme or metaphor in all the Bible. It's very diverse. Many nuances of meaning, and yet it's very attainable. And so... And so it's very familiar to us in our experience, this idea of seeing and light. And because of that, it it can be easy to overlook the importance of light, both in our experience and in the biblical revelation, because we are immersed in this reality. It's like trying to explain to a fish the meaning of the water that he swims in. Who is right now considering the reality of light in this room? We more often presume on light than meditate on it. It is more a means to an end, the flashlight on your phone, the headlights on your car, the streetlights in your neighborhood. And yet, it is the initial backdrop, the broadest context for most of what we're thinking about in life. We contemplate what light illuminates. Light and seeing are 
very important biblical themes, and therefore they are woven into our worship and our language. And so consider the themes of our great worship songs. From, from amazing grace, t'was blind, but now I see. To the theological classic, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Both of those proclaim profound gospel truths through the, through the imagery of light and sight. All that we experience in life with light matters. And so this morning we'll talk a lot about it in the context of what Jesus is saying. And when all of our experiences with light meets our experience with the words of Christ here, the two converge. And in some sense they're combustible and a greater meaning is ignited. And we see him. And God gives the greatest vision of all, that of the soul perceiving by faith the beauty and sufficiency and sacrifice of Christ, the light of the world. Now, I know that not everyone sees light physically. There are some who either cannot see at all or have greatly diminished sight. And we have dear brothers and sisters in our church unable to see or to see well. And I've thought about you all week in light of preparing this message. And, and, and sight is not our only vehicle of perception. And though these brothers and sisters may not see with physical eyes, God has given them great vision, great faith. And that is the point of light and sight in the Bible, to move from seeing to seeing. Jesus healed eyes to heal hearts. And so we're thankful for the faith of those brothers and sisters. And I rejoice with anticipation for when they will see in heaven. Think of our great experience with light for a moment. Who hasn't been lost and needed light to find your way home? Who hasn't been afraid of the dark and had your parents or your spouse turn on the lights and you found comfort in the light? Who hasn't looked up into the night sky and felt a sense of unexplainable awe? And wonder at the stars and the massive expanse as the galaxies and the universe, they preach something to us. They say something to us. Who hasn't gotten up early in the, in the morning at the beach or the mountains or maybe just in your neighborhood to witness darkness turn into light? To see the sun rise in all its burning splendor and color and contrast. Light means something to us. I think I've told this story before, but it's, it's so dear to my heart. In my 40s, I didn't really pay attention to the aging process. Sort of a passive denial. And I, I didn't really realize that I was losing my hair, even though the youth continue to tell me bald jokes. <laughs> and I didn't realize how much my vision was changing. And so I went to the doctor, and he told me three things. He said, you're old, go to Costco and get some glasses. <laughs> And I will never forget the first pair of glasses I got. It wasn't too long ago, four or five years. I went to pick them up with my family, and, I, and when I put them on there in the optical department at Costco, it was like someone slapped me in the face, and I woke up. I was stunned by what I saw. I walked around the rest of our time staring at the ceiling in Costco. <laughs> Have you ever seen the ceiling in Costco? It's magnificent. Big, bright lights and girders and rafters and huge fans spinning over the checkout area. I was surprised by the clarity of what I was seeing. I didn't even know how bad my vision was. When Jesus claims to be the light of the world, there is a freight train of biblical meaning that comes crashing into the station in a way that all of our experiences with light find clarity and meaning and purpose as they land on him. And we behold him and we're never the same from that vision. 
This morning, I want us to think deeply and textually about light so that through the testimony of Christ in John 8, 12, we might see Christ in all his glory as the light of the world. Our outline is pretty simple. I want to work through three building contexts from the creation context to, to some Old Testament meanings of light. And then I want to finish in the John chapter 7 and chapter 8 context, which is the Feast of Booths. And then I'm going to give us five brief implications of Jesus as the light of the world from John 8, 12. So first, the creation context. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. It was shapeless. It was empty. You might have a footnote in your Bible that says it was a waste. And darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And so the picture here is unformed, dark chaos with the spirit of God hovering over the waters about to unleash creative genius into the scene. And then Genesis 1, 3, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God's answer to unformed darkness, his first brushstroke of creation is to speak light into that darkness. Not like when you tell Alexa to turn the lights on, but when the God of the universe, by his sole power and authority as the omnipotent sovereign over everything, speaks, and that which was not suddenly is. That which could not have been apart from him explodes on the scene, and there is light in the universe. There's illumination. This is by design from the very nature of light. People turn the lights off when they don't want to see or be seen. God turned the lights on in the universe. Why? So that we could see the light and what that light is shining on. And he gave us eyes to see, not just to see arbitrarily, but so that we could see what he had made and in so doing see him. The author of it all, the creator of it all. The creation of light is the opening scene of the redemptive drama in which God is the supreme actor. It's as if the curtain is down on this formless and void creation. And everyone takes their seat and the music begins to swell and the curtain rises and the spotlight shines into that darkness. And the story begins and there is revelation The first revelation of God himself in creation. This God who is light, he makes light. Jonathan Edwards, in his dissertation on the end for which God created the world, says this. And if it was God's intention, as there is great reason to think it was, that his works should exhibit an image of himself, their author, that it might brightly appear by his works what manner of being he is. And afford a proper representation of his divine excellencies, and especially his moral excellence, consisting in the disposition of his heart, then it is reasonable to suppose that his works are so wrought as to show this supreme respect to himself, wherein his moral excellence primarily consists. Translation, in the painting, the painter is on display. In creation, God is revealing himself. The lights are on in the universe so that we can see God. Psalm 19.1, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. And light enables that vision. Paul says it this way in Romans 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Meaning that since the lights are on in the universe, God has been revealed to us and we have no excuse but to worship him. The atheist is accountable to God simply because he opens his eyes. And the science of seeing, therefore, has vast spiritual implications. As the light rays enter through the cornea. And the cornea bends the light rays, so they pass through the pupil in the center of the iris, which then passes through the crystalline lens, which shortens and lengthens its width to focus the light. 
the light rays then pass through a dense, transparent, gel-like substance called the vitreous, coming to a sharp focusing point on the retina in the back of the eye, capturing all of the light rays, processing them into light impulses through millions of tiny nerve endings, then sending them through over a million nerve fibers to the optic nerve, which carries the image to the brain. And the atheist sees the creation, but he doesn't really see the unbeliever, the non-Christian. He sees light and creation, and, and in so doing, he should see God. But sadly, he doesn't see him at all. His heart stubbornly, sinfully reinterprets the meaning of the images. He suppresses what is firing through his optic nerve every moment of his life. And though the lights are fully on in the universe, mankind lives in sin and darkness, and we are unmistakably blind. And then the argument is made that obviously the creation account is not literal because you don't have any source of light yet. Sun, moon, or stars until verse 14 of Genesis 1, until day 4. And you can't have light without a sun unless that's the point. God is light. He is the source of all light and all life. And he needs no other source. He simply says it and it is. Light illumines, it clarifies, it reveals the truth of what is really there. Light governs us. It rules over us by separating light from darkness so that we are in submission to the order that light brings. In verses 14 through 19 of Genesis 1, it describes the creation of the sun, moon, and the stars and the order that they produce. The day-night cycle is a light-dark cycle, and it defines our days. The lights in the heavens govern the seasons and the days and the years, and, and we can't change that. The sun comes up and it runs its course and it sets and it closes out the day. It establishes the rhythm of our lives. And we learn to submit to the order that light brings. Every single one of us enters a dark room in the middle of the night. And we must decide if we're going to risk it and walk across that room in the dark or submit to the need for light and turn the light on. And if we don't submit and we step on a Lego or a Nerf gun or a plastic teapot and we go stumbling over some piece of furniture, we are disciplined by the light. <laughs> and it's almost proverbial that the fool enters a dark room and does not turn on the light. We all do it still. Drive your car without the lights on at night. Turn off all the lights at the airport. Turn off all the street lights in Denver for a night. Go camping without a flashlight. None of this will go well for you. Light illumines our experience and it governs our lives with the truth of what is really there. And that is the divine point that the text is making from Genesis 1-3 to John 8-12. The Old Testament highlights and expands our understanding of light. Light is seen in the Old Testament as judgment. I'm sorry, darkness is seen as judgment. Light is seen as deliverance. Sometimes light is, is portraying God's very presence in deliverance. When the Jews are fleeing Egypt, God is with them. How? He's with them by day in the cloud and by night as the pillar of fire in the sky. And he leads them. His very presence, his glory, leading them out of their slavery, leading them to the promised land by the light of his presence. Exodus 13, 21. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way. And in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Light is seen in the Old Testament as guidance, wisdom, truth, salvation. God's leading, the very word of God is seen as light. Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Psalm 43, 3, oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my, my path. Darkness, on the other hand, pictures the absence of the presence of God. The absence of guidance and truth. It pictures punishment, hell, hopelessness, sin, evil. 
Light perhaps has its most pointed meaning in the prophecies concerning the Messiah. Isaiah 9, 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Isaiah 49, 6. He says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. That is precisely the prophetic hope and anticipation into which Jesus speaks in John 8, 12. So if you'll turn back to John chapter 7, I want to take a look at the immediate context of Jesus's words. The context of John 8, 12 really begins in the first verse of chapter 7. At the time of the Jewish, Jewish Feast of Booths. And it leads up to chapter 8, verse 20, where John tells us retroactively that Jesus had spoken the I am statement in the temple treasury. Which was during or perhaps soon after the Feast of Booths. And chapter 7 and really chapter 8 are full of controversy in the crowds wrestling with and arguing over who is this Jesus there's initially two questions that are being asked one is in chapter 7 verse 11 the Jews are asking where is he and then verse 12 says the people are essentially asking who is he by verse 14 we're in the midst of the feast and Jesus is teaching openly declaring exactly who he is as he does so willingly Jesus is never hiding himself from us. And so he's among the people. And some believe and some are confused and some are angry and some are curious and some are just flat out amazed. But by chapter 7, verse 37, we know that we are on the final day of the Feast of Booths. And the debate continues right up until 753. From 753 to chapter 8, verse 11... It's the story of the woman caught in adultery. And early manuscripts do not contain this, this account. And that doesn't mean it's not true, but most likely it wasn't canonical. Most likely it was a true story that was added later. If that's the case, then our context is still that of the last day of the Feast of Tabernacle. Or sometime soon after. And so we pick right back up in 812 with the I Am State. So just a little background on the Feast of of booths and the Feast of Tabernacles, same thing. It's one of Israel's three great pilgrim festivals. It's detailed in Leviticus 23. It's celebrated in the fall at the time of the harvest. In gratitude to Yahweh for his provision both now and in the past. And it lasted for seven days, during which time the people built booths, shelters. And they lived in them to commemorate and to remember their time in the wilderness. That they were a pilgrim people, a lost people being led by God, and God delivered them. And at some point during the festival, on certain nights, and commentators, there's not a lot of consensus on this, but the general idea there is. At some point during the festival, on certain nights, four huge lights were lit in the court of women. Maybe 75 feet tall, filled with large amounts of oil that would burn all night, light, all night long and light up Jerusalem. And this was a major time of celebration among the Jews. In, in the Mishnah, which is a collection of oral traditions about Judaism, it says this about this fire celebration at night. It says, at the end of the first festival day, the priests and Levites went down to the women's courtyard and there were golden candle holders there with four gold bowls on their tops and four ladders for each candlestick. And four young priests with jars of oil containing 120 logs, some unit of measure, would climb up, climb up the ladders and pour the oil into each bowl. And they would light the candlesticks. And there was not a courtyard in Jerusalem which was not lit up from the light. The pious men would dance before them with flaming torches in their hand, and they would sing before them songs and praises, and Levites, beyond counting, played on harps, lyres, cymbals, and trumpets, and other musical instruments. 
And so this, this celebration of God was centered around the light that was radiating from the Feast of Booths against this backdrop of darkness. And this celebration was so intense, the Mishnah also says, anyone who has not seen the rejoicing of this fire ceremony in his life has never seen rejoicing. Carson says that the, 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 the uh, Levitical orchestra cut loose. And these people are worshiping God. They are celebrating the light of deliverance. But consider the tragic irony of this context. The nation of Israel is fiercely celebrating God as light and the light who delivered them. The cloud by day and the fire by night from their slavery into the promised land. They're singing and dancing and praising and the night sky is lit up with firelight. While the light of the world, the very object of their worship, walks among them and is in their midst. He's right there and they don't see him. And whether it was during the festival lights in the darkness after the festival lights were put out or with the festival lights fresh in their minds, Jesus spoke into this context and declared in no certain terms that he was the light of the world. John 1, 4, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 9, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Some are believing, some are not. And at some time later, they would take the light of the world, and they would demand his death on the cross. They would try to put out that light once and for all. The whole picture, the whole context is more tragic than anything else. John 3, 19, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. I'm going to give us five implications of the I am statement that Jesus makes in John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So what does this mean today for us? What does Jesus' statement, this claim, mean for each one of us? It doesn't mean that Jesus is simply shiny. That he's some vibrant personality. And he wants to shine some sunshine on your day. The first implication of what he says is, is this. What he means by what he says is first, number one, the light has come. Jesus is the light. Full stop, exclamation point. The fulfillment of all the meanings and symbolism and development of light in biblical history has come in him. This is no small statement by any means. In light of the entire revelation of scripture from Genesis to Revelation concerning light, he is that to which all light points and the source from which all light originates. This means everything for humanity. This means everything for you. It means everything for me. The plane has landed. Salvation has come. Hope is here because God is here. Jesus created light. He is the light. And there's no darkness in him. He illumines our way back to God. He is the great light of the Old Testament prophecies. He is wisdom and truth and guidance and salvation. He is the very presence of God. And when the light has come, there is finally hope for sinners lost in darkness. The second implication is that the light is necessary. The world needs this light. You need this light. It always amazes me when I come into a dark room in my house and I find one of my children reading a book in the corner and I ask them, hey, do you want me to turn on the lights for you? And they say, no, I'm good. How can you possibly be good trying to read a book on the thinnest margin of light you can possibly have to, to see the words? Light is necessary for the activity but I'm no teenager, so I just move on from that kind of logic. 
Just yesterday, a brother was telling me he went to Lowe's to get brighter light bulbs for his ceiling fan fixture because those little candelabra bulbs are they're too dim. They don't give enough light, not enough wattage. Light is necessary, and more light is better. No one ever says, this room is too bright and vibrant and alive. Let's dim it down and, and, and close off the windows so it's dark and gloomy and hopeless. We want light to come in. Light is necessary. It's essential. The world needs light physically, and how the world needs light spiritually to show us the way. Jesus speaks this I am statement in a world characterized by spiritual darkness. Why? Because those in the darkness need light. The world needs him. You and I need him. How could we not need him? Consider the darkness of the world for a moment. The kingdom of this world, ruled by Satan and sin and self. It's godless. It's unrighteous. It's full of every kind of evil. It's hopeless and cruel. It's abusive. It's spinning out of control. And it's, it's just simply dark. So here's the question. Do you have the light of Christ? Have you followed him? Have you trusted him? Have you been born again from darkness to light? Each of us needs the light of Christ so desperately. We can't figure this out on our own. We can't remove our sin from us. We've offended a holy God who dwells in unapproachable light. Absolute perfection, and he has precise judgment and severe consequences for disobedience. Have you found your way in this life? And I don't mean to self-fulfillment or to self-made religion or inner peace. I, I don't mean have you found your way to financial security and temporal prov provision. Have you found your way to God? To a saving relationship in which God is your father and you are his child and you are forgiven. And there is peace between you and the God who made you. Where there is sin, there can be no peace. Where there is darkness, we cannot approach the light of his presence. And so what am I supposed to do in this darkness if I don't know Christ? And this is where I think the, 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 the way that Christ uses our experience is so attainable. Do what light demands of you. See. Look. Believe. Believe in Christ. Crucified on a cross to take the penalty of your sins. Risen from the dead to bring you to God. See with the eyes that he has given you, whether they're physical or not. See with the eyes of your soul this Christ who brings light and salvation. Go. Go where light leads you. His light leads us to himself, that we might be saved. So repent. Follow him. If you follow Jesus, you will not walk in darkness any longer, he says. If you do not follow Jesus, you are still in darkness because darkness is defined as not knowing God. Not trusting Christ. The third implication of this I am statement is that light is singular. Light is unique in this context. This light is mutually exclusive to all other lights. There can only be one light. The sister verse of John 8, 12 is John 14, 6. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Light encompasses all of these words. The way, guidance, the truth, what's really there and life itself. And so John 14, 6 is, is almost a divine commentary on John 8, 12. And in it, Jesus is telling us not only to trust in him for salvation, but he is excluding all other attempts at light. All other so-called lights are frauds. They're fake. They will not save you from your sin and they will not bring you to God. They will not justify you before him. Jesus is exclusively the light because his claim is a divine claim. He's claiming to be God, the God who is light and who is life. And that makes his claim unique. How could there be another light? When you have Jesus, you need nothing else. You need nothing. You need no one else. 
You're complete and forgiven and you have the righteousness of Christ. Nothing can add to that. He and he alone saves. The fourth implication of this text is that light shines inherently. That's the nature of light. It, it shines. It illumines. It is the very nature of light to lead and to help, to assist, to guide, to illumine. And this, this is an evangelistic context. The people at the feast are wrestling with who Jesus is. They're lost in their darkness. And into that darkness, Jesus declares himself the light. He shines into the darkness of their need. John 3.17 for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. The shining of light is the love of God for sinners. So this morning, if, if you're not a Christian, don't, don't ignore the light that is shining for your good in Christ. Don't, don't despise His kindness on this day as we read this text. Some of you are content to stay in the darkness. And the implication of this, this statement is that Jesus is saying it so that the light will shine on you and bless you. And, 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 and it will be the love of God for you. And you will respond in faith and you will come to the light and be saved. And you will have eternal life. Come to Christ. Receive his love while you still can. Fifthly and finally. The fifth implication of Jesus' claim to be the light of the world is that light conquers darkness. For those that have seen this light, the darkness is over and it's over forever. John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness but will have the light of life. When a person follows Christ, the light has come to you. And it's never turning off. We become children of light in Him. And the darkness passes, and we possess this eternal life forever. Jesus is making an indicative statement. Follow me, and you won't walk in darkness. Follow me. And you'll have the light of life. There is a promise in those words. A divine certainty in what he is saying to all who will hear and respond in faith. Paul says it this way in Colossians 1.12. At the end of his prayer. He says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness. And transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is what the Father has done for us in the Son, who is the light of the world. He's qualified us. He's rescued us. He's transferred us. And in Him, we have it. We have all of it. Redemption. Life. And how we hear these words, they affect how we live the Christian life. If you're a child of light, live as a child of light. Stop living like we're kind of in the light, or we're kind of here, sort of there in the light. Jesus doesn't say that. His promise in this verse is full and it's final and it's powerful. It's not partial. It's not temporary. You will have the light of life. All that light means comes together in Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness. And it, and it did, and it conquered that darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And he really did, if you believe in Christ. Creation to new creation. Physical light to spiritual light. If you turn with me to Revelation 21, we'll finish in this text. Revelation 21, 22. Someday, all other sources of light will yield their place to God in the new heavens and the new earth. And light will forever emanate, not from created sources, but from God himself and from the Lamb. Revelation 21, 22. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. 
And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean. And no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. For those of you who, who cannot see with your physical eyes or see well, there is a day coming, not too far away, when your body will be raised from the dead imperishable and and glorious and on that day you will see with new eyes but the glory and the wonder of heaven won't be that you see it will be who you see and that applies to all of us because together as one people of God we will be we will behold Christ in all his glory, forever, with our eyes and with our hearts. And we will live in the light of his presence in unending joy. It's a day worth waiting for. It's a vision worth seeing. And so see him by faith today so that you can see him on that day face to face. Father, what a glorious vision of the end, which really is only the beginning. God, thank you for creating light. Thank you for sending the light. Your perfect son laying down his life for his people. God, we rejoice to have received that light by faith. And I pray for any person who is lost and walks around on your planet breathing your air beholding your glory in the creation but doesn't know you God we we beg that you would shine the light of Christ into that darkness and you would draw sinners to yourself God thank you for the light of the world in Jesus name The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.